Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Tim Marr, at Tim Marr on Instagram, found the carnivore diet after having surgery on his abdomen. Finding meat was the only thing that made him feel good. He's also a testicular cancer survivor and recently ran and hiked a 100-kilometer ultra to raise mon- money for Movember. He's also a very successful artist, and I'm thrilled to have him on the show today. Welcome, Tim. Thanks, Scott. Glad to be here. Awesome. Well, tell us a bit about your health before carnivore and before being diagnosed, you know, what is your, what has your life been like with regards to your health and diet? Uh, generally I like to keep fit and, um, sort of started running in early 2018, um, after just getting inspired from David Goggins, a lot of that kind of stuff, um, inspired me. Um, but my diet, general diet was, I'd say it was pretty bad. I guess it was sort of a mix of uh, uh, like a high fat, high carb sort of diet. I would eat a lot of creamy, cheesy kind of pastas, load up on carbs before big runs and that sort of thing. Didn't re- I knew about the carnivore diet, but never really got into it. Just didn't um, feel I needed to. But I, I also did have. I never went to the doctor about it, but I like IBS issues, bloating, and did have like a lot of loose stools, um, but didn't really do anything about it in terms of diet. Just kept on fueling myself with high carbs, like high fat. Uh, now looking back at it, I don't think it was really that healthy at all to eat like that. But yeah, so. Yeah, that I mean that makes sense. That's what, what like kind of standard nutrition advice everyone's following. Yeah, and a lot of times, you know, I come from a high endurance exercise background, rowing for me. And when you're doing that much activity, you feel like, oh, I just need to fuel myself. I just need to eat like an exactly athlete, right. And when you, I also um, had been listening to a lot of Zach Bitter. Mm. Uh, he's he's a low carb endurance athlete, I, I suppose you could call, but he uses carbs strategic, strategically um in races but yeah i also heard about another guy called mark mcknight who he actually did a 100 mile run just with zero fuel like he wow um so that sort of inspired me and made me think about different fueling strategies just yeah that you don't actually need that many carbs and yeah yeah. And you could become a fat adapted athlete, I guess, which yeah. was interesting to me. Yeah. And um, how did this, how did kind of that coincide with your diagnosis? Can you talk a little bit more about when you first learned about your testicular cancer, how you responded? Like, I, I can't even imagine, but tell us, tell us some of that story. Yeah. So it started uh, in 2018. Um, it was probably early September where I noticed like a small lump in my right testicle. It was quite quite a small lump, like less than the size of a pea, really. And I didn't really, I just kept checking it pretty much. I didn't really do anything about it until about a month later. Um, I got that checked to the doctor. When was it? It was a Friday afternoon, I remember. Um, so. The doctor wasn't really concerned about it. He just said, okay, we'll get an ultrasound and some blood tests. So then then had them done on a Friday. Then the, the Monday I went back, actually got a call on the Monday saying it was a pretty urgent call. Um, so I went back on Monday, pretty much 
uh, said it's pro- most likely testicular cancer because you can you can tell from the ultrasound. Normally, that's a good guide. Um, and also, the blood test showed my HCG level was rising or was risen, um, which males' HCG level should be pretty much zero, and mine was slightly above that. So that was concerning. Um, and I was diagnosed with a mixed germ cell um, tumour. Um, so it happened pretty quickly. Like the next week, I was pretty much within two weeks, actually, I was booked in to have my right testicle removed. So, and that really just hit me because I was, I'd only just started running that year as well. And I had a marathon, Melbourne Marathon was booked in. So I think I did that two days before the surgery. So I got to, uh, I got to run the marathon and two days after that I had my testicle removed. And then they were saying that it was it were caught pretty early, so everything looked normal afterwards. So I was put on surveillance. Uh, three months later, uh, the HCG level in my blood was rising again. So that meant chemo. So middle of Feb, I had to go through nine weeks of chemo. Um, that was a shock again. I just didn't want to put my life on hold, you know, and then I had to, uh, so it was, that was nine weeks. So that was three rounds of, um, it was called BEP chemo. That's uh, just a combination of chemotherapy that works well with this type of testicular cancer I had. Um, which is, and it was a, it's a 95% survival rate with this. So it's a, all the doctors that I went to all kept saying of, if you want to get cancer, testicular cancer is the one because it's such a high cure rate. So that sort of made me feel better, but not really. Um, um, but before the chemo, I sort of made a, wanted to keep running and not sort of read into what the side effects were and just sort of hopefully keep moving and just keep sweating and trying to feel good through it. That's sort of the only thing I could could sort of control through this time. Mm-hmm. So I thought I'll try and keep moving. And um, in the end, uh, yeah, so I got through the chemo fairly well, except for the last, the last round of chemo was getting wearing me down. Um, but I still managed to sort of get moving every day before the chemo was, um, before the IV fluids, I tried to get up before early and then try and sweat and work out before that. So I've tried, I have managed to do that every day um, and I found that that made me feel a lot better because the chemo, for me, it made me feel like a, uh, it was like the probably a worst hangover feeling after drinking and it sort of stayed, that kind of feeling stays with you the whole, for the whole nine weeks, I felt. But the the working out and sweating and everything sort of alleviated that a little bit, I found. Um, what else? Also, yeah, just I was eating really badly during that nine weeks because I was sort of just eating whatever I could handle, to be honest. And they also put you on um, a drug called dexamethasone which is a, I think it's a cortical steroid drug, which increased my appetite. I actually gained weight during the chemo um, just because of, I think it was that and all the fluids they were giving me. But I actually gained weight. But I still, um, yeah, throughout that, I still managed to run a little bit. Um, and, yeah, four weeks after that finished, I ran another marathon. That was probably one of the hardest ones I've tried to run before. Uh, wow, four weeks after chemotherapy. Yeah, so because wow. I, I managed to sort of still sort of train throughout the chemo. Um, yeah, because I, I just feel like I just I could do it Crazy. just because it was making me feel better. <laughs> to be honest, just yeah, sweating. Yeah, you have, to have some outlet. I totally understand that. Yeah, yeah, uh, and then so. Eight months later, like I was put on surveillance again in in remission, all clear, blood levels clear after chemo. So that was like really good news. Uh, then yeah, eight months later, the 
CT scans showed like the cancer spreads from the testicle to your lymph nodes normally first. Um, and so one of my lymph nodes on the CT scans eight months later was still above the recommended uh, size. So they want it to be under one centimetre, all of your lymph nodes, but one of them was still, I think, 1.5 or 1.8 centimetres. But uh, I've always explained it's most likely benign and you, you'll be getting the surgery, but they'll most likely find that it's just going to be scar tissue, benign leftover tissue that won't turn cancerous or anything, but it's just protocol to get rid of that if it's over that certain size. So I made the decision to get the surgery. Um, yeah, so that was in May 2020 when that was booked in for. So uh, another, yeah, before that I decided to, yeah, I, I want to keep running and um, still inspired by like all the, like David Gawkins still. So I sort of trained again from December until May, I trained and did a 100-kilometre run before then. Uh, and then I think it was about two weeks later, that's when the surgery I had, it was a robotic surgery to remove. I had, I think I had about 20 lymph nodes removed um, wow. in the abdomen. So, but it was a, I was happy about it because I didn't have to have the, the traditional open surgery where they, they would normally cut a huge, uh, cut from just under your chest all the way through past your belly button um, and that's how they normally would remove them. But uh, I got to have the robotic surgery. So I uh, was about five small cuts just below my, near my belly button area. Uh, and that was a supposedly, yeah, it's a, it's a lot quicker recovery like that as well. So um, I was happy about that. So yeah. So, and then, after that surgery, the surgeon puts you on a low-fat diet for four weeks because of a – it's a rare complication, I was told. It's called chylus ascites. It's where the, um, like, lipid-rich fluid leaks – can leak into your abdomen from where the seven uh, lymph nodes are, and it can cause just, like, a huge uh, uh, build-up of fluid and they'll – if that happens, you have to go back to hospital, get a drain, get that drained out. So they put you on a low-fat diet to avoid any complications. Um, that was that was probably the hardest thing I had to do because uh, of my normal diet, which was huge, rich in fatty foods and carby sort of foods. I was um, so after four weeks, I lost about ten kilograms. What's that? Twenty something pounds. Wow. In four weeks, I was so weak. Uh, I, no one could recognise me. My face was gaunt. <laughs> but and then also, I noticed I I couldn't really. I I was eating all like carby foods with no fat, but I could um, couldn't really keep anything down. Couldn't eat because I was getting so bloated and everything as well. I felt like um, my previous IBS issues were like ten times worse. And I was probably from surgery as well, but then I just noticed even after four weeks, I would still get really bloated. And um, so then I went back to the surgeon and the doctor and they've said, okay, you can eat whatever you want now. Uh, so I decided to go <laughs> go for the, like went straight for a big lasagna. I think I got my first meal <laughs> back and that was a big mistake. Uh, I... Um, I couldn't really do anything for two days after that. I was so bloated. It was like a permanent bloated state I was in. Um, uh, so I was, I was just experimenting with food for a week after that, of different food that I, I might be able to eat without getting bloated and having these like loose stools. Just like I was just like, you know, just wanted to gain weight again and get back to training and stuff. Um, and I did remember all the stuff I've, because I've listened to stuff about carnivore diet for years before this and didn't really give it a thought up until now. I thought, well, <laughs> and then I went on to uh, Sean Baker's website, MeetRx, looked up all the studies and just to be, I just didn't want to start it and then 
not know anything about. So I read, kept getting into it. Then your podcast, kept listening to more and more about it. So that's, uh, yeah, so I started doing that. Started with just steak um, and eggs. And I noticed, yeah, that I was noticing I could eat more food, not get as bloated. And as the weeks went on, uh, it was working. So I just kept going with it. Um, and then, yeah, so during that time, I trained up again because um, I wanted to do another 100 kilometer run in at this place called Listerfield Lake, which is probably it's just a national park with us. Nice trails and stuff. So I wanted to run 100 kilometers there to raise money for Movember. Uh, and yeah, well, all my training runs were, were done like in a fasted state or, um, up to time miles carnivore as well. So everything was working for me on carnivore. Like I wasn't getting bloated. Um, yeah, I remember I could, um, I could even eat also before I could go for a run, which I could never do before, like, because it was just my RBS issues, I guess, and just being bloated. I just, I would never eat before a run, but now I could actually do that if I wanted to, which was interesting. Um, and just, yeah, every, I could, uh, I know Zach Bitter talked about how his inflammation isn't as bad after long runs and stuff and races from if he stays away from carbs. And that, that actually really, I noticed that a lot with my knees and everything, like how much better recovery was and that sort of thing, which is, and I just, I was thinking, geez, I've been doing this wrong for years now. <laughs> I should have been doing this for years. Uh, but then, yeah, so training went well. Um, I ended up doing the run without, like, I, I think I came pretty well fat adapted after all that. And I was able to do that 100 kilometer run in November few weeks ago now um yeah without any food i i took in just uh exogenous ketones as i was you know yeah and i yeah i completed the run yeah and i'm just happy that um i found a carnival diet basically after everything and yeah A lot of people ask me about how to make liver more tasteful and how to cook it or incorporate other organ meats on carnivore. Optimal Carnivore can help you do just that with their grass-fed organ complex. It was created by carnivores for carnivores. They start by sourcing 100% grass-fed organ meats from New Zealand, gently freeze-drying the organs and encapsulating them into convenient bovine gelatin capsules. Just six of these capsules a day is the same as eating an ounce of raw organ meat. I personally take these every single day, as does my wife. Even though we both eat liver and other organ meats, our ancestors would have eaten the whole animal. And this unique blend has nine different organs, including beef liver, brain, thymus, kidney, spleen, etc. And I think it's great to get a daily dose of these organs when you can. So it covers all your bases, whether you're at home or traveling. What's also cool is they plant a tree for every product sold, which helps the environment. Visit www.optimalcarnivore.com slash carnivorecast and use the code carnivore10 to receive 10% off your purchase. Thanks and back to the show. Yeah, it's amazing. Wow. There's so much there, Tim. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's incredibly um, inspiring and uh, moving. And I, I can't imagine what you must have gone through emotionally and mentally during this time. Um, like just absolutely wild and unbelievable. Um, what I'm curious as, as you went through, like, as you were going through this, you know, what was going on in your head? Like what types of things were you telling yourself? You know, did you feel like, just like on to the next thing, here's another challenge, let's get after it. Or were there times where you broke down you felt like you couldn't move forward? Like, Talk me through some of, some of your mental talk um, as as things were unfolding. Yeah, well, basically, yeah, when I found out I had to have chemo, that was probably the worst thing because just the lifestyle change, just the stop of your life, that really brought me down. I just, um, for a few days, my girlfriend had, was, was there with me the whole time, so that helped and 
Um, but I was just in a bad state, just didn't want to uh, think about how my life was going to change and I just didn't want things uh, to change. So I just sort of, I think I used exercise and running as a way to deal with it all, to sort of feel like I was still in control somehow. Um, you know, everything was changing. Um, so, yeah, I guess I was dealing with it, yeah, but like that. And then then just being uh, told eight, eight months later that more surgery has to be done, that hit me again. And I was like, oh, I just kept getting hit with more news that yeah, uh, can't win. I couldn't keep going forward in life, I guess. And I think just having these, I don't know, just these runs sort of helped me, I guess, get through it as well. Just these challenges for myself to still uh, make me feel like I was progressing, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's really powerful. And you talked about your girlfriend. What was... Like, what was the support network like um, along the way? You know, your family, your friends, maybe other cancer uh, patients or survivors. You know, who who did you meet? Who did you bond with? Uh, yeah, so my girlfriend and my mum were there most tra- most treatment days when I was in for chemo. Uh, they were really supportive. A few friends came in as well. Um, what else did I do? I've Actually, I went on Reddit a lot, just on the forums there, found a few very similar stories. A lot of the guys have very similar stories, go through the same surveillance, and it's like an anxiety you go through for scans. They call it scanxiety, you know, like that's probably the, the thing I didn't realise going through it all, how much anxiety you, I would get uh, just waiting for results. I think sometimes that was worse than the actual treatment I found, just that kind of waiting and not knowing what was going to happen. Yeah. But I did, yeah, I just I found stuff on forums and stuff, people talking about it. Yeah, that helped a lot. And what did um, folks close to you think about the decision to try an all-meat diet or did you not really share it with them? Uh, I didn't really share it with them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just because didn't want to get into this whole thing about because I know some, like a lot of people say oh meat causes cancer and <laughs> didn't want to just get into it as some kind of argument like that so I just sort of just went with it didn't tell anyone for a while um yeah my girlfriend she's a nurse now so she got didn't really um well so I went over the like I just talked about it a lot with her and she was just sort of yeah if it's making you not, if it's not making you bloated, then yeah, sounds all right. And we, yeah. And uh, I'm I'm just super curious because you seem so inspired by David Goggins, and I read the book yeah. and it had a big impact on me. And you know, I I don't practice everything he talks about in the book. I I I should. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he'd probably slap me for, for even saying that, but, um, I'm curious, like, have you reached out to him? Have you shared your story with him? I think he would probably love to hear like the impact you made on his life. Oh, I haven't actually. No. <laughs> yeah. You, you totally, totally should you Yeah, should share your, share your story with him, whether it's this podcast or just a message. I think he would yeah get a lot from that. Yeah, I get inspired by people like that. Just, just the, I think it's the mind body connection, like the mind mental toughness that's really appealing. Just, yeah, because I think that got me through chemo as well. Just thinking, um, just some days not wanting to get up and stuff. I don't know, just using your mind, power of the mind is what I'm interested in a lot of the times with that kind of stuff. And I, I guess like ultra running. There's a lot of that mostly I found. It's it's more mental towards in the tough stages of running rather than physical, I guess. And yeah. So that's just everything that's happened to me in the last few years is I feel like it's made me better at uh handling ultra runs, I guess. Yeah, and do you feel the same way about like the chemo and cancer treatment that in some ways it's more more mental than physical? 
Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, it's mental just because it's a constant, yeah. You just don't want to go. Like I had to go back on the first, for the first week of every round, you just have to go back every day and you're there pretty much all day in hospital. You just don't want to keep going back. That's mentally, you just don't want to get up, don't want to go, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. And it is, for me, I found it was more mental as well, which I, but I know some of the guys really suffered during the chemo after listening to some of their stories, like on Reddit and stuff. So, um, oh, I think, yeah, I just, I handled the chemo pretty well, I guess, which was, which was good. Yeah. And, um, I'm curious, like what, how, what goals do you have with the diet now? Or like, um, yeah, what, what, what keeps you on the diet and what goals do you have with it? Uh, I was just, uh, listening to Zach Bitter, I actually want to just incorporate like strategic carbs, I guess, during on a big event sign a day, see how much my performance can increase like that, like he, how he uses it. That'll be interesting to see. Um, so I'll just experiment with that kind of stuff and yeah, still want to be pretty similar diet because of how well it's going. So, but I, I do want to, I don't know if you've introduced foods back in or not, but I'll try, maybe try that. Yeah. I think approach. that's really smart. I have, I've done yeah. that and yeah, uh, helped others through it as well. And I think for folks who it, it doesn't bother and, and to have reasons to want to add back in foods, I think it's a great idea to, to test and be intelligent. Yeah. 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 And Tim, um, what does like kind of a day of eating look like for you or kind of how do you, how do you think about using the diet both just on a daily basis, weekly basis around your, around your training? You know, tell us some of the details. Uh, okay. So I normally, I work, um, pretty early in the morning and get off early afternoon. So I don't, I normally fast during that period. So I don't eat in the morning. Um, my first meal might be, two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I eat liver as well now. Um, so I'll eat around, yeah, two or three o'clock. I'll have probably six to 12 eggs a day. I normally have about two to three meals a day as well, or normally two. So six to 12 eggs, steak, ground beef, liver, um, we have a lot of kangaroo in the supermarket here in Australia as well. Sometimes I'll eat some kangaroo. It's um, really lean, isn't it? Really lean though. So you have to add a lot of fat to make it, or for me to make it tasty. And, um, yeah. And then I found, well, I found also with the, when I was training and running more, I would just, it's like a, the diet self, you self regulate how much you eat. It's, it's good. Like, I remember, and then now, uh, two weeks after the event that I ran, um, I just don't eat as much. It's just like I'm not trying not to eat as much. It's just my body just being satiated without having to self-regulate. I don't have to self-regulate. And I know that traditionally when I, before this, when I was eating that huge high-carb fatty kind of meal, I'd eat heaps of calories and then the event, race would be over but i'd continue to just eat heaps after that um but now as with this it's just sort of just you self-regulate it's good it's a good way to eat i think yeah absolutely i think that's a huge part of the diet is just the sustainability and the, the mindlessness it really uh, frees up your yeah. mind to focus on yeah that's the, that's the thing yeah it does isn't it yeah in, in the willpower aspect too, when you're eat, when you know you're going to be eating meat and like you don't have to think about how much of other foods am I eating, it allows you to really divert your energy and focus to other things, which you need a lot exactly. of. <laughs> <laughs> um, and do you think this diet could work for other patients on chemo or other cancer patients or folks with similar conditions? Yeah, I'd be interested to see how um, if I was having. I was on this diet during chemo and how that would work, but um, I'm not too sure about that. Yeah, because uh, it's sort of it. When I was on chemo, everything sort of tasted a bit metallic-y, 
um, and the smells of foods, certain foods put me off a lot. So I'm not sure how that that diet, if you really want to eat that kind, this kind of diet on chemo, it might be different for everyone. But, yeah, so I'm not, not sure about that, but it could. I know that they don't focus on diet through any of the treatments. So they don't really talk to you, which is a bit um, disappointing, say, giving you like sugary foods and carby sort of stuff, which is probably not the best uh, advice, uh, I wouldn't say, but yeah. Yeah, for a lot of people, isn't chemo like destroys your appetite, right? And people are yeah. losing too much weight and under eating. Yeah, and that's why they, they I'm not sure, well, with my um, uh, chemotherapy, they put me on dexamethasone, which is that kept my appetite up. It was sort of it's like a stimulating feeling being on that as well. It was hard to sleep, um, but that that sort of made me crave any like a lot of food, which is why I probably, probably put on weight during chemo as well. But you just I just craved like really bad food, you know. I was eating like microwaveable meals during that time, anything that had a lot of taste, I guess. I think I just lost my taste. I was just anything really salty and, uh, yeah, I'll just crave that kind of food, which, yeah, maybe kind of I would have been good because there's a lot of salt, salt, like I put a lot of salt on everything now and um, it could have worked back then, yeah. And uh, you're also an artist, Tim. You have some amazing art. Folks won't be able to see this because I don't do... Oh, thanks. Fortunately, <laughs> but uh, how does that play into you know your running, your your mentality, all these things? What what part has art taken in your life? Uh, so yeah, I only started like as a hobby in probably 2017. I started drawing, and then uh, I started doing more of it uh, when I got diagnosed, basically, and sort of have started from then. Did you have any training or lessons? Uh, oh, I, not no. I just drew when I was a kid, and in high school, I remember drawing a little bit, but never just kept going with it. To be honest, um, wow. yeah. So it's just a hobby, my art at the moment. But yeah. Hopefully, yeah. you're super yeah. talented. Um, I'll definitely link to uh, some of the some of the work in in the show notes. Thanks. And uh, really appreciate you coming, Tim, and sharing your story. I think folks will find this really inspiring and valuable. Um, where can people find you if they if they want to follow along with your journey, learn more about you, things like that? Uh, so just basically, I've just got an Instagram account at Tim Ma, and that's M A double. It's triple R actually on Instagram. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some most of my artworks up on there as well. So yeah. Awesome. I'll link to that in the show notes. And thanks again for your time today, Tim. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered, or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.